Question four, wing, year end December 08. Introduction says they are um, thinking about the impact of a global pandemic. And we remember what they mean by a global pandemic as a, a generation we've lived through one. So fine, there's been article on it. They've been talking about this quite a lot. Let's have a look at the question. Questions in two parts. The first requirement, where are we? Here we are. Explain the impact of all of this on three things. Going concern, onerous contracts and investment properties. So do you have some accounting knowledge on going concern and on onerous contracts and on investment properties? Yes, you do. Then we just need to link it back to the scenario, don't we? Scenario is very long, I think so. Um, if you need to, pause the recording and then we'll talk about what's there in just a minute. As you look through the scenario, we noticed again that uh, the government had been helping companies, perhaps like systems of furlough or whatever, helping out with short-term finance. <clears throat> there was a suspension, though, of the manufacturing operations. This, remember, is a textile business, perhaps to stop the epidemic spreading. Perhaps they shut the factory or were told to by the government. So clearly, that makes us think about going concern. Uh, they can, they're no longer manufacturing now, so they're having to buy stuff in at greater cost, which is making you think about onerous contracts. They've got investment properties, and of course they're giving us a hint that they want us to demonstrate knowledge of the standard on fair value, which is so highly examinable at the moment. And the directors say they're not going to look at market prices, even though there have been, again, um, there have been transactions, so there is a market out there, but they're not going to look at those market prices. Remember, with investment properties, if they have to write them down, it hurts the profit and loss. Debit P&L credit investment property, the directors will not be enthusiastic about that. So there's my scenario. So with each of these... I need to say, what is the theory about going concern? And then apply it to the scenario. What's the theory about onerous contracts? Apply to the scenario. And the same with investment properties and fair values. First of all, going concern. Theory, well, you learnt this in AA. And I guess that, that that's never really left you. Presumption that business will continue indefinitely. Remember, it's 12 months from the balance sheet date under international standards. Then there are two possibilities. One is very rare and one is very common. The rare one is the green one. The common one is the yellow one. If it's not a going concern... They have to do the accounts on a breakup basis. Very rare. Much more common, they'll make disclosure in the notes to say that there are uncertainties again because of the pandemic, but you don't need to show all the assets as some breakup valuation. So the yellow is the normal situation. Now, apply to the scenario. So, Reasons why we are a going concern. I've just picked these words up from the scenario. They've got a profitable history. They're taking advantage of government support. Reasons why it's not a going concern. They've stopped their business. They've got loss-making contracts. We don't have an answer, but we're at least demonstrating that we can apply our knowledge to a particular scenario, pick up those words, 
make sure you're using all the words from the scenario. So back up here. So the history of profitable operations, taking advantage of government support, they are good things. Bad things, of course, are the additional costs that we're being forced to suffer. Now, onerous contracts. That's part of provisions, isn't it? So you need to define provision, define onerous contract and apply it to the scenario. Provision, remember, liability of uncertain timing or amount. Onerous contract, a contract where the costs exceed the benefits. Here we are. Onerous contracts. Explain why in this scenario it's relevant. The contracts are now making losses because they can't manufacture internally. Define onerous contract and define provision. Perhaps you remember this point that when you have a, a loss-making contract, you have to say, well, what would I have to pay if I cancelled it? What would you have to pay if you fulfilled it? And you'll take the lower because that's the route you would actually take as a business. You'll cancel the contract if that would be cheaper than actually carrying on with it. Lastly, the investment properties. <clears throat> so, IFRS 13, define fair value. Do you remember in IFRS 13, there are three levels of valuation. Level one is where you've got the value of an identical asset in an active market, like a share. Level two, the value of a similar asset in an active market. Level three, unobservable figures, because there is no market. We're at level two. You always are with PPE, with investment properties. So that would be some good knowledge to put down. So define fair value. Price received in an orderly market between market participants. If you've put that definition in another answer, maybe question one or something, don't refer it. Don't say, please see question one. Just type it again. Technically, it's a level two input. You have to look at the price of similar properties in an active market. Why have prices fallen? Well, is it forced sales? Not really. Forced sale, again, is last resort, isn't it? when they've really got you by the throat. It's just they're having a rough time. Everyone's having a rough time. Prices are down. It's just happening. So it's a regular fall in price. Probably active market. They'll probably need to write down investment properties. Make sure you've told them where the loss goes. Please remember, it does not go in OCI it goes in profit. So it will reduce their profit. It will not reduce their OCI. That's why the directors are so sensitive. Let's move to the other requirement. Well, there's a lot of things here, isn't there? So, what is the nature of the information that investors will expect to be disclosed as a result of the pandemic? Hmm. Think about disclosure of uncertainties. Think about un events after the balance sheet date. Think about government measures. Think about covenants. So you can almost see there are five things there, aren't there? Nature of information, again, are uncertainties, events after the balance sheet date, government measures, covenants. So lots of things to talk about. And two marks again with this question again for clarity and quality of discussion. You're going to get one of those marks, I think, if you just make sure you've put some subheadings in. So I can see five subheadings there. There's one of the marks. 
The other mark, again, well, it will depend on your clarity. We might get it, we might not get it. You may find it useful to pause the recording again and just think about those headings. Uncertainties, post balance sheet events, government measures and covenants. So just pause, have a think about that with the scenario before we carry on. What is the nature of information? Well, surely this is the characteristics of financial information as defined in the framework. So you don't need to write them all out, <clears throat> but remember they're words like faithful representation, comparability, understandability, it's all those words, isn't it? Uh, relevance. Uh, understandability we've done. Timeliness. And there's one more, isn't there? I use a mnemonic, which is Fred, Ran, Under, The, Chelsea, viaduct now I remember the other one is verifiability I was wondering in the whole exam why they hadn't yet tested the framework but they are so you don't have to talk about them all but it may just be that gets you going to try and make a couple of comments and that's much better isn't it than just using words like true and fair at random so here's my answer Nature of information generally, I've picked up some of those. It needs to be relevant to investor decisions. It needs to be clear, that's understandable. And it needs to be faithfully representative. So that's words like without bias or complete. Then pick up on the headings. You can see those headings they asked us about. Disclosure of uncertainties, events after the balance sheet date, government measures and covenants. So, disclosure of uncertainties, in particular, I was thinking about things like onerous contracts, where you would have to explain what the uncertainties were in terms of their loss making. Um, something which... I think insurance may have been mentioned. Was it mentioned in the scenario? I can't quite remember. I'm just looking back for a moment. Um, perhaps it was, perhaps it wasn't. But I know that the examiner in the answer mentioned insurance claims would be uncertain. Yeah, well, I think that's um, a bit over the top, but I've, I think I've stolen that from the model answer. But I said, well, onerous contracts, they're uncertain. Um, Post-balance sheet events, it's a pandemic. So things like progress with the vaccine or whatever you're kind of thinking about. Again, this company's not developing the vaccine, but clearly the progress that's happening out there will help us determine, you know, how we think about these post-balance sheet events. The grants is easier because they've got to be matched against costs in the P&L. So things like furlough grants and so on. And covenants perhaps links back to going concern. Hard little question, isn't it? But I think you pick up straightforward marks by using the characteristics of financial information. This stuff that's here in green, this is the bit that I worry about. Could you use different words than that? No, I think the green bit you need to have in. Whenever you're talking about investor information, you need to use those characteristics. Um, but it doesn't have to be the three I mentioned here. It could be any of the six that arise. In terms of the rest, you just do your best, don't you? And you say, well, is there anything that I could say? So I think there'll be much more open marking with the yellow bits. That's the end of the debrief on question four.